Good morning, Carson Newman University, formerly known as Carson Newman College. Hi, my name is Reverend Charles Leo II. I'm the proud pastor of Gospel Temple Missionary Baptist Church, and here it is in my beautiful, in the beautiful sanctuary of Gospel Temple. I'm also a Carson Newman alum, proud graduate of the class of 2011 with a Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Studies. So God bless you to all the students, to all the faculty, to all the people that, and the faculty that were there when I was there. God bless you. Again, students, we say welcome to you all as well. Um, and just the beautiful thing about this is that I was just one of you all um, in that beautiful place on Mossy Creek. And I thank you all for allowing me to come and be your chapel speaker on this morning. And I'm not going to be long. Um, I just, just lift up a few things. And it's actually found in the book of Ezra. Uh, in the book of Ezra, um, you read chapter, we'll read chapter 3, um, the end of chapter 3. Um, we'll read chapter 3, beginning at verse number 11. I'm going to skip around a little bit. And chapter 3, verse 11, it says, from the New International Version of the book of Ezra, it says, with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout and praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping, because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard far away. And in the chapter 4, verse 1, it says, When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esharadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. And down to verse 4, it says, Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. Go on to chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. It says, Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Edo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Josadak, uh, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So, uh, just for the time uh, that we have to share together during this chapel service, I just want to lift up these words. We have work to do. We have work to do. And here we have in the book of Ezra, literally, um, is... An interesting story because the people, the book of Ezra starts off with the people leaving out and still actually still being in the midst of exile. And they're in the midst of exile and they get a, and then all of a sudden King Cyrus of Persia makes a decree that he gives them the ability now to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. And it's interesting that they have been exiled because exile is a place of being cut off. Of not being able to be around what you what you know from familiar sights and sounds. And here they are, they're cut off from everything. They have to be able to start anew, start a new life in exile. And now all of a sudden they get a call now being able to say that exile is over. And the exile is over somewhat. That you all can go back and start to be able to rebuild the temple of God. And I can imagine... For those who have been in exile and now get to go back, and I can imagine that can create some fear and some anxiety. Because what will it be like to go back? What will it be like? Who is there? What does the what does the city look like? What do the, what do the ruins look like? What 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 does it look like outside of this situation that we're currently in? And for you, my students and my faculty, and those of you who are watching, who are sitting here watching, that is the same question I believe that a lot of you all are having to, to ask yourself, what is life going to be like after this pandemic? What it will be like to return back to campus? What can be done? What will it be like to go back down to the, the shores and to be able to sit and be with our friends? And what will it be like to sit in the cafeteria? What will it be like to be able to go to a basketball game and to be able to sit with a crowd or be able to sit and watch a football game in a large crowd right there in Burke Tar Stadium? What will it be like? And unfortunately, I believe that life is going to change for us forever. But there is hope for us today because the Lord has shown us in this text 
that life can begin again. And that we can begin to put the pieces of our lives back together again. That when you read, you'll understand that there's an importance for them, not just to rebuild the temple, but to rebuild the temple, but also for worshiping. Because in the text that I've read to you in chapter 3, what you understand is that they have not even built the temple, but they laid the foundation for the temple. And when they laid the foundation for the temple, now they are institute worshiping at the temple. And worshiping is so crucial because worshiping is what allows us to be able to relate to God. And the interesting thing is they don't even have a temple, but yet they're worshiping. And just like so many of you all, that's what you all are doing on today is that so many of you all, if you're not back in church, you're worshiping without a building. And you're worshiping without the comforts of sitting in pews and nice chairs and being able to sit close to your neighbor. But the thing is, is that worship for God is not confined to a building. But worship of God begins in the hearts of God's believers. Worship of God begins with us being able to say that we belong to God. And worship for God is so crucial for us to be able to deal with these difficult days. Is that we must continue to uplift and to magnify the name of our God. Because God's name is a stronghold. God's name is a defense against all that comes up against us. And what's so interesting, too, is that when they lay the foundations of the temple, what you will find out is that the people that take and build, the, that lay the foundations are not just older people, but it's young people, millennials, Generation Z. Those who are 21 years in age, you will know that because you will find that when they want to build the temple, rebuild the temple, they go and get Levites at the age of 21. That's right. They go and get people your age, just like you are sitting there in the, in the prime of their youth. 21 years of old and here it is those 21 year old people have never seen the temple never laid their eyes on the temple but the older people who had been there who have gone through the exile they remember what the temple was and they remember how beautiful and nice it looked and what ends up happening when you read the story is that the older people are upset while the younger people are shouting because they have begun the process of being able to create community, to be able to create communal worship, to be able to create a site. Because you got to remember, the temple is not just a place of worship, but it's political, it's civic, it's communal engagement where people come together and things are done, things happening, things are happening in the temple. And so the young people are so ramped up because they finally get to play a part. They get to build this glorious temple, to rebuild the temple that they heard so much about. And here it is, the older ones who remember seeing the splendor of the last temple, the first temple. And here they are, they become upset because what's built now doesn't look like what was built. And oh, that's a word of caution for us, my brothers and my sisters, my young brothers and my sisters, and also my faculty, the staff, to everyone. We cannot be so consumed in trying to keep on holding on to what is old. But my brothers and my sisters, we must begin to be able to bring together voices of old and new, to be able to continue to create community, to create harmony. Because whenever there is dissension, whenever there is craziness, whenever there is people who are disagreeing, people who are shouting, people who are, are going against one another, my brothers and my sisters, that's when we allow the enemy to creep in. The enemy is able to sow seeds of division, seeds of discord. But I'm here today to let someone know that we have work to do. It's imperative that Carson Newman continue to be a community that is appreciative and is able to appreciate all voices. Let me repeat that Carson Newman must remain a place where all voices can be heard. That it must be a place where people can know that they can come with their sacred questions and with their sacred uh, inquiries and come knowing that wherever they are, that they will not be shamed, but they will be appreciated. They will be loved. They will be nurtured. And that's the reason why I love Mossy Creek so much is because it learns how to appreciate the diversity of voices. Learns how to be able to help those who do not understand, to be able to create community. And here it is, we have in the text, when we read down to Ezra chapter 4, is that the noise that they are making, that they make, it draws the attention of the enemy. And my brothers and my sisters, I just want to know, and the question that I ask is, when we emerge from this, we emerge from this pandemic. Are we going, what are we going to build? Are we going to continue to let the fusses and the cries 
continue to slow us down? Will we continue to be able to not get along, but will we be able to emerge and to be able to build a community, a beloved community, a community that loves and appreciates all of God's children? That is the question. After pen, in the midst of this pandemic, my prayer is that you have been that you're beginning to be able to realize that all of us are made by the hands of God, that all of us are equal. Because this pandemic has touched all segments of population. Old, young, black, white, male, female. We've all been ravaged by this pandemic. But we cannot allow ourselves to be caught up in arguments, in pettiness. But instead, in order to build beloved community, we must understand that God requires for us to be able to love one another. Here it is. The enemy gets in there and the enemy gets everything shut down. Everything is stopped. Everything is halted. Because the enemy appeals, because the enemy realizes they found a way to stop progress. And unfortunately, that is the fear that I have. Is that progress has been being made on that campus. Since its inception, progress has been made. Progress has been made in being able to create ministers, pastors, nurses, doctors, teachers, lawyers, all of business people who have a mind for thinking and loving people and creating the beloved community here on earth. Progress cannot be shut down, my brothers and my sisters. Progress cannot be shut down on this beautiful place called Mossy Creek. And here we have here. Is that what eventually happens is, is that when people begin to not be able to want to create community, it creates the opportunity for rampant individualism. How do you know that? Because when you read Ezra chapter 5, you hear the names of Haggai and, Haggai and Zechariah. And when you read the story of Haggai, you will learn that the people of God, they had abandoned the temple and instead started building their own houses and putting nice roofs on their houses. And they became instantly focused, which means they began to focus on me and mine. And not we and ours. And unfortunately, this is what is what I'm afraid of, is that people now are caring more about themselves and caring more about what's going on with them than they are about each other. That's the reason why wearing a mask is not a political debate. Wearing a mask helps to create and helps to cultivate and keep safe our community. It's not about your own individual discomfort. But it's about you being able to understand that if you love your brother and sister, you will do what is necessary in order to keep them safe, to keep them protected. Rampant individualism is always the death nail of any kind of beloved community. When we start worrying about who and myself, me, myself, and I versus we, our, and ourselves. It's imperative that we understand, my young brothers and sisters, that we begin to understand that the beloved community cult makes us and it calls us all to love and to look at each other as those that we're children of God. And on today, my challenge is to you is to say that we have work to do. That we must come together in the midst of this crisis. It's imperative that leadership listen and understand that there has already been community created here. While those who are new, while those who have already been here must still be able to listen to leadership and to be able to give voice and to be able to hear the vision and that's laid aside and that's already set aside. All of us must come together to be able to continue to create community and make it and make Mossy Creek and make Carson Newman the place that God has designed for it to be. You students are the ones who make Carson Newman to be what it is. It's not the faculty, it's not the administration, it's the students. And if the students can create community and it is imperative upon the students to continue to show faculty, to continue to show not just the Carson Newman, but show Jefferson County, Jefferson City, to be able to show Hamblin County, Knox County, to be able to show not just the counties, but to be able to show the state of Tennessee, to let it ring all the way across the state of Tennessee from Nashville to Memphis, to 
be able to say that at Carson Newman College, Carson Newman University, we create community. We are about being able to create all of God's children, a place where all of God's children can come to learn, to discuss, and to grow. That's the reason why I came. I came to Carson Newman to grow, to learn, and to create community. That's the reason why God is upset with them. Why they have stopped building the temple is because they have failed to continue to create community. And if they had come together, they would have stamped out the enemy. If they had come together, they would have been able to shut down everything that had gone up against their way. But we thank God for the prophets who show up. Because the prophets are the ones who call them and call them and call speak truth to power and tell those who are in charge that you are wrong, that you keep on building. Don't be afraid of what's coming your way, but keep on building because God requires us to be a community. God requires us to be the people that he desires for us to be. And I'm here today to let somebody know that we ought to thank God that the Lord has a way of sending us exactly what we need in order for us to get off of our cans and that we're not doing anything, but instead God sends us prophets that speak his word, that speak truth to power, and that force us to be able to come together and to rebuild the ruins that have been left. And that's my message for you on today. That's the word that God wants me to, to give unto you all today in chapel is that we have work to do. Let's get back to building community. Let's get back to making and knowing that God requires us to build kingdom here on earth. A place where all of God's children can feel comfortable, can feel safe. Because my brothers and my sisters, under the cross of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, there is no black, there is no white, there is no blue, there is no red. There is no Jew, no Gentile, slave, no free, male, no female, for we all are one. God bless you all. I pray that this message was a blessing to you. I pray that you all continue in these difficult days to continue to lean on each other and to create community, to create a virtual community. God bless you to the president, to the faculty, to all of my, my fellow, to all my former professors. God bless you. We thank you. And again, this is my prayer all the way here in Memphis, Tennessee. Carson Newman, we have work to do. We have work to do to create community, to create the beloved community for all of God's children. God bless you. Until next time. Hey, Carson Newman. Thank you all for joining us for our online chapel today. I'm Austin Hall, a graduate assistant in campus ministries. We wanted to follow up with you and offer the opportunity to connect with you. If you have any questions about things that you heard in chapel today, feel free to send a message to the email that's on your screen. God bless you. all Have a great day.